What would it be like to grow up in a polygamous cult? And what would it take for someone to muster the courage to leave? Our guest today, Jared Larson, lived in a polygamous cult in Utah as a teenager, but now as a student at Gordon-Conwall Theological Seminary. Jared, thanks so much for joining us. It's a thrill to have you here. And super cool haircut, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Great minds think alike, right? <laughs> there you go. Well, I've been looking forward to this for a while. So let's just jump into You lived in a polygamous cult as a teenager, but you grew up in what's often called the mainstream Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Tell us a little bit of what that pre-cult uh, experience was like. Yeah, I was the youngest of 10 kids. Grew up uh, in a small t small Mormon town in northeastern Arizona, Snowflake, Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, and my ancestry on all four sides, both of my families, my mom and dad's sides, branched clear back to the beginning of the church wow. uh, in the days of Joseph Smith. So we were deeply rooted in the faith. My dad had served as a Mormon bishop for seven years. He had a part of high council leadership there within the community. So, so it was our life. Everything about that was, you know, our whole life was focused on our Mormon faith. But my parents, particularly my mom, she had always kind of been unsettled about the current position of the Mormon church and how they've changed mm -hmm. so much since the days of Joseph Smith, because they have changed dramatically as the decades pass and as uh, the, cult the culture changes, the church has kind of shifted its doctrinal beliefs to go and change with it. Um, and there was a sense of, of unsettledness growing inside okay. of our hearts. And so they found this group up in uh, Utah that pretty much adhered to all the doctrines that Joseph Smith had, had that the, as the Mormons call, restored the true gospel. They lived polygamy. They lived the law of consecration where they would give all their things to the church and then it would wow. be divvied back out. The law of gathering where you would have to go where the church was to build up Zion. And so just a lot of the doctrines, all the doctrines that the Mormon church has changed, had changed. This cult went back to the way Joseph Smith did it. And so I was about 14 when they decided to leave the Mormon church and move us up to Utah to join this, this polygamous cult. Okay. Now we're going to, in a minute, come to what that experience was like, but of those 10 kids, where did you fit within the mix? The youngest. I was the youngest. Oh, Wow. You were the yeah, youngest like, of yeah. 10, you said. Okay. So, so would you and, describe... Sorry, keep going. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Those first, I think you said, 14 years of your life, were they happy? Yeah. Were they stressful? What What was that experience like for you? They were happy. I mean, hmm. I loved my family. Um, I like pretty much worshiped my older brothers. Mm -hmm. They were all out of the house by the time I was starting to grow up and remember things. They'd all gone on missions, served two years on mission. Wow. Um, and so I really was just in the home with my four older sisters and then one brother above me. And yeah, it's was, it was wonderful. I was the youngest, so it was hard in that sense that you would get with any normal dynamic of a family of being the youngest of 10. The, the brother above me was the golden child. So I was kind of always trying to wow. live up to what he could do. Uh, so there was those type of struggles, but no different than what you would typically find in a, in a Mormon family. And it was, it was comparable to any Christian family that you would see today. Okay. There's nothing extreme, nothing other than just the Mormon belief, right? The Mormon, their Mormon beliefs, but it was just a happy, normal family. We loved each other. Family was everything, as it often is in the Mormon church. Mm -hmm. And then when my parents joined the cult, it really broke us all apart. My oh, my older okay. brothers stayed. They stayed a part of the Mormon church, mainstream Mormon church. Wow. My sisters and their husbands joined the cult with my parents, but then a couple of them left almost immediately. Um, one of my sisters became a second wife immediately when they joined the cult. So all this division then suddenly struck our family when my parents decided to, to go to Utah. So growing up, happy childhood, you were going to go on your mission and just live out as a member of the mainstream church of Jesus Christ, a Latter-day Saint. That was the plan. And then when you were 14 years old, the apple cart got unsettled or upturned, so yeah. to speak, and everything changed. Everything changed. I was anticipating going okay. to high school. That's all I'd wanted. And all that was taken from me. Wow. Okay. So tell me that first moment where your parents broke to you this shift that was coming 
to to move to Manti, I think it it is, right? Yeah, yeah, Manti, Utah. Um, they they had been going up to Utah. The, Jim Harmston was the leader of this cult that was beginning to grow and rise into popularity at the time. It's back in 1993, 94. Um, and my parents had been attending. He put on a two-day seminar, which he called The Models, and he would present all the ways the current Mormon church had changed the doctrines from the days of Joseph Smith. And he'd do this within a two-day span. People from all over would come and listen. Wow. And my parents heard about this. They started going to it. That's really when they became converted to this group and decided to move, uproot everything and go and join because that's where Zion was now being built, where the true gospel was, was being lived out. And Jesus would return to this place. And so there's all these building beliefs. And they began to share them with me when I was a kid. And I remember us, them sitting me on the front porch telling me they were going to leave. And I really wanted to stay because I wanted to play football and basketball. I wanted to go into high school and, and drive and start dating. You know, all the things you would anticipate as a kid, all the things I'd see my older siblings do that I was anticipating on doing. Um, but my mom said something to me during that conversation that really struck me and really was what compelled me to sacrifice it all and leave. And she was always kind of the extreme religious type of mindset. And okay. she said, I, I truly believe, Jared, that the, it was, I'd been growing up in the Reagan, Gorbachev, Russian America days, right? And so all that was in the backdrop. And Russia was always, she believed they were the great Assyrian that the, the Bible talks about, and Revelation and Antichrist, Gorbachev was the Antichrist and all that. But she said, I really believe the Russians will, will, conquer america by your sophomore year and destroy all the wicked in our country Wow! so think about that you know if that's going to be fulfilled then that means if you're found amongst the wicked you'll be destroyed and so that those seeds of fear had already been planted but that kind of was pouring the water on it and bloomed the sprout to life and that was really what motivated me to follow them to the cult Wow. Now, people watching this who didn't grow up in that era, I'm probably about three or four years older than you, as best I can guess. I grew up in the Reagan era, Gorbachev, yeah. Rocky IV, like the Russians were the yeah. bad guys. <laughs> we we're afraid they were going to invade. You know, there's movies that were about this. So now it right. might seem completely outlandish, but at that era, I could see why, especially in that context, especially coming from your mom, somebody could be like, okay, I get it. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. So absolutely. So she tells you that puts you over the top and says, "All right, we've got to do this." Literally, the world is coming to an end. How quickly did you move to Manti? Was it like pack up your stuff and go? What was that process like? It was a it was a pretty quick, swift process. Um, it was it was it took a few months, but by, from the point of that conversation to when we actually moved. I graduated from junior high and we left a couple of weeks after that. So it was sometime mid May. So it was like somewhere from March to May. So it was just a couple of months essentially. So, okay. So this is in Manti, Utah, which I think has about three or 4,000 people. It's pretty small. So yeah. were you moving? Sometimes when people hear polygamous cult, they're thinking of like some compound that people lived in or a home and then just met. What did you move to? We moved into a small, the small town of Manti and everyone had their individual homes. We didn't have a compound. We didn't have a restricted space where only, okay. where, you know, where we lived. We were amongst the other more, the mainstream Mormons of the community. And it really began to create a sense of, of uh, instability amongst the Mormons because now this polygamous cult, which the Mormon church rejected us because my parents were excommunicated and all that. And so oh, we wow. were kind of rejects of the faith. And now we were moving into their their little community, um, which was mainstream Mormon. They have a big white temple on the hill. And so it did cause a bit of a ruckus when we all came in. So, yeah. Okay, so the mainstream LDS church would call, the name of this was the True and Living Church of Jesus Christ of Saints of the Last Days. They would say, you guys are a cult. Would they use this language to describe this church? I think they would. I think. I mean, okay. I don't remember anyone calling us specifically a cult, but we were rejected by them because of polygamy immediately would would cause as means for excommunication within the Mormon Church. Um, okay. And we disavowed the authority of their current prophet, and we had our own true prophet that God had ordained. 
to 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 operate in the way Joseph Smith had restored. So, so you move into this small town in Utah that's mostly mainstream LDS. But when I checked online, tell me if this is correct or not, it said between maybe 300 and 500 members of this cult that you were a part of. Are those numbers correct when you moved in roughly? Not when we moved in. When we moved okay. in, it was a couple, we were one of the first ones there. Uh, oh, wow. The, yeah, the church really started in May of 1994. There had been several years leading up to that with Jim Armston, who was the leader doing different things but there's only a small group there before that but when they became official it was like in 1994 we were maybe a couple hundred at that point okay. our the height of our of our number was maybe 350 to 400 so that was okay. really as big as we got so it's close to 10 percent of the town is not insignificant you can't avoid yeah. <laughs> this issue it's going to be everywhere yeah. so you move in did you is there a public school that was there were you homeschooled what was that high school experience like for you yeah, it was a very uh, apocalyptic type of mentality, very fear driven. Jesus was coming. And so mm -hmm. to be in the world meant wasting your time in the world and all of our energy needed to be exerted and focused on preparing for Christ. So they didn't, they frustrated outside education at the time. Um, they wouldn't allow it. And so the church had their own little academy, which I attended for about a year. Um, and then I, until I turned 15 and dropped out of it and just started working. So I didn't, my last form of any type of public education was eighth grade public school. Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So how did the church practice its faith and its doctrine? What did that look like daily, weekly? What were the rituals and the practices that you did? Oh, uh, well, that's part of, that's a, an interesting question. That's a part story because it did intensify over the years. Okay. Um, initially, when we first came on, it was you, they had established their own temple, which we called the endowment house. Um, someone had essentially re, uh, refurbished the upstairs of their barn and mm. put up sheetrock, put down carpet, and they made it our temple so that that's where we would go in and get the, get the, the priesthood keys and all these rituals that we would do that Mormons do in their own temples. And we do it in this barn. And then essentially we had our own priesthood callings of, of, of how we participated and they called a bishopric, they called 12 apostles. There was the prophet and his presidency to, he had two counselors. So I was initially, I think when I was, I received the priesthood at 14, which in the Mormon, the, the Melchizedek priesthood, because the Mormon church has the Aaronic priesthood, which you get when you're mm -hmm. 12 and the Melchizedek priesthood, when you typically get around 18. Uh, when you go into the temple for the first time. But this cult, because they were adhering back to the days of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, there's there's records and documents showing that back then young men were actually possibly getting their priesthood of much younger age, particularly oh. Joseph or Brigham Young, some of Brigham Young's sons. Okay. So we use that as justification to then have some of the worthy younger men get their priesthood blessings. And so at 14 or so, I got the Melchizedek priesthood and went through my temple endowment and was immediately called as one of the elders quorum in the elders quorum presidency. I was like the second counselor of the elders quorum. So. so like how many days a week were you meeting? How much time was involved with the people in this cult? Yeah. Initially it was every day. I mean, we were oh, wow. moving new people. Yeah. We were moving new people wow. in. We would have weekday meetings, you know, a couple okay. weekday meetings and then Sunday, obviously. And sometimes our Sunday meetings would go on for hours and hours. We didn't put a limit on it. And so it would just be open to how the spirit led, the Holy Ghost led. And that would sometimes go on for five, six hours. Wow. So uh, the majority of our life was definitely dedicated to it because we had the mentality that we were preparing for Christ's coming. We believed that we, we were his called and elected, his chosen people, that he would come to us first. And then he would ordain us with a power, a, a certain priesthood power, to then go out and implement his judgment on the world, destroying the wicked, cleansing it for the, you know, for for his kingdom to come, for the kingdom of heaven to come, and for his will to be done here on earth as it does in heaven. All was that, all that was going to be done through us as his instruments, and so our whole life was dedicated to preparing so that we could be worthy for Christ to come to us, because he wouldn't come unless we showed and manifested a sense of, of worthiness and obedience to what the instructions the prophet was giving us. So. Okay, so if the 
if the prophecy was that Russia is going to come and destroy, and I guess this is around 1996 would have been your sophomore year, was the preparation we've got to pray and be spiritually ready? Or we've got to be ready like in Red Dawn with weapons to defend against the invasion that's coming from Russia. What exactly did that kind of preparation entail? Yeah. Well, w w kind of one clarification. It, that was my mom's opinion and belief. That okay. wasn't necessarily okay, got the it. cult's opinion. Got but it. The, cult did, the cult did believe that an opposing army, that, which we called the Assyrian, would come and do essentially what my mom was thinking the Russians would do. So Got it. in preparing for that, it was mostly ourselves spiritually. We were, there was a sense of street smarts that we knew that if we tried to stockpile all these guns and take out the US government, <laughs> if they tried to come after us, <laughs> that we would lose. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that would be evident. <laughs> so it was more so of this spiritual preparation okay and, and being worthy so christ could come because then christ would give us supernatural powers to take out the u.s government and Got do whatever it. we needed to do so that was the mentality spiritually being absolutely obedient to the prophet and his commands because we believed him to be like god's right hand man on earth wow. what he said god said to go against him would be to go against god so it's really all about obedience uh to the commands he gave in the minds of people, what gave him authority? Were there stories about him like he did a miracle or he fulfilled prophecy or was he just the classic, charismatic, compelling person that just sold this story to people? Yes. <laughs> hmm. Mostly the classic, charismatic person. He never did any miracles. Okay. Uh, he, he gave prophecies that he said would say was fulfilled but never was. But he was very charismatic. He he says he received his priesthood when four angels visited him. He, uh, it was Noah, Enoch, Abraham, and Moses, uh, the four patriarchs. That's what we what we how we understood them to be, and they gave him the authority, much like uh, John the Baptist and Peter, James, and John came and gave the authority to Joseph Smith. He had his own version of this divine authority directly given to him by them stepping through the veil is what they would call we would call it and laid their hands upon his head and blessed him with this authority to essentially re-restore the gospel that joseph smith had begun so i saw that he passed away i think it was 2013 in such a small community yeah. did you know him personally or was he kind of inaccessible and apart from everybody oh i knew him very personally mm. <laughs> my mom mm. was married my mom after we moved my dad took a second wife um, and soon after that, my mom actually left my father and became his eighth wife. And then after that, a few years after that, my sister left her husband and became like his 16th wife. So my mom and my sister were both married to him. Okay, so h help me understand from the outside looking in. I mean, it sounds crazy. Why would anybody want to be an eighth wife? I mean, I hear my wife sometimes. She's like, we took a trip to... Uh, Kenya and had a chance to do some basketball ministry with Muslims and we had a conversation I was sitting there with my wife and the guy goes hey so how many wives do you have and he was serious he's like I, I can't remember what he said I have three or four or five something like that and my wife was like I would never remotely want to be in that <laughs> context at all like why would a woman be drawn to this yeah. what's the draw from the perspective of your mom and your sister and so many of these women choosing to do that yeah yeah he did because he had a total of about 18 wives i think at the most um it was his spiritual status his leadership his ability mm. to be able to be this voice from god um to to having that sense of strength and assurance and spiritual character that we within the context that we were operating in right and so that was the biggest draw and him being essentially god's right hand man we believed we believed in this this um doctrine that the early uh pro leaders of the ch mormon church taught called multiple mortal probations it's a controversial topic within mormonism but essentially okay. it's like reincarnation but you mm. you can only come back as a man or come back as a woman if you were a man or a woman in your last life you can't come back as like a blade of grass or anything like that you have to come back okay. as that okay. same sex so we believed him to be 
Joseph Smith in his past life. We believed him to be oh. all these different characters, prophets in the Bible, Isaiah. Uh, this was all revealed to us through Revelation, uh, not to me personally, but to him and his yeah. wives. And so he had this, this sense of just divine authority directly from God, which was such a huge draw, especially to women seeking strong spiritual leadership, strong, um, a strong husband who was right with God. And so that was just a huge draw with, with the type of women that this cult attracted. Hmm. And that's really the best, I don't know, I might be able to give you a better answer, but that's as good of an answer no, I can think of now. That, that, that's totally fair. So yeah. when you move into this community, was there kind of a honeymoon phase where it felt like we're a part of something bigger, we're doing something special, we're one of the select few on the planet who have this revelation God's going to use us? Like, was there kind of that honeymoon period? And if so, how long did it last before things started to fall apart? Yeah, definitely honeymoon period. And that for me, anyways, it was different for everybody that went, but for me, it lasted about six years. I was full in, full invested, preparing um, from 14 to 20. Um, And then about a prophecy was given by Jim, the prophet that Christ would return on a certain day, March 25th, 2000. Um, and by that time, he was, has a, he was the established voice of God, right? To go against him would be to go against God. But then it ended up that God, obviously Christ didn't come. <laughs> mm. And so that night we were just like, it was like, if you would have like had a camera and zoomed in on, on the scene of our life, you would have seen people in the church just waiting and anticipating uh, for we had prof- he had prophesied that there would be plagues that would sweep through the town and the valley, that it would cleanse out the wicked, that we would be the ones left, and God would restore us and, and bring us the glory and power that He had promised us, so that we could then go out throughout the world. And the first place we would go and bring down was the corrupt Main Street Mormon Church and their mm. leadership, because they were the great abominable church. So that night of March twenty fourth, two thousand, we were like anticipating it, waiting in our beds, waiting for the clock to strike midnight so that this would all happen. When it didn't happen, obviously that's when seeds of doubt sprung up in my mind. And I knew something wasn't right, but because it was such a fear-driven cult and I had such that deep-seated fear I talked about earlier, to allow myself to question that he wasn't God's prophet was the scariest thing. Because if I was wrong, then that meant I could not be forgiven my sins. I would be condemned forever. There was no op- there was no option for wow. forgiveness with our mentality and where we were at spiritually. Like we believed that everything was so reliant on us for Christ's coming that for mm. us to rebel against him meant that we were actually preventing him from coming because we had to merit a certain status of righteousness for him to come. So that causes you to think, oh my gosh, if I'm wrong, then I might be the cause for why Christ didn't come. And this is like ingrained in your psyche. And as a teenager, that was just told to me over and over again. So I began to doubt then, but I wouldn't allow myself to really entertain the doubt, though it stuck and clung. And it just began this whole 10 years of just being caught and trapped in this darkness and this fear and this inability to hurdle all this this fear and doubt I had inside of me. Okay, so hold that thought for a second. I want to enter into that 10-year decade. But when you talk about roughly 14 to 20, you said it was kind of a honeymoon phase. But you also said early in your life, family was everything. And some of your family rejected uh, this belief and stayed in the mainstream Mormon church. Was the mentality just, they don't get it, too bad for them, hopefully they will come over? How is this a honeymoon phase at the same time some of your family was torn apart? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was exactly that. It was it was essentially if they didn't join, then they would be condemned to die when the destructions came. Um, And that was a hard pill for my parents to swallow. Like they. Wow. In their hearts, I don't think they truly believe that Uh, even having Mm. behind the scenes discussions with them. But it was the mentality you had to have to be faithful to the prophet and what the work we were doing and the momentum that we felt like we were creating for Christ to return. And so they wouldn't allow themselves to really mm. have that connection, that, that inherent internal connection that they had been living, abiding in their whole life that had to be cut off because the work of God was more important. 
And so if they weren't on board, then they would be destroyed when the, when the destructions came. So for me to like go to that place for them and say, oh, should I seek advice from my older siblings who never came? Should I seek kind of solace or some type of sanctuary with them? That really wasn't an option for me because I wasn't prepared to lose my whole salvation by doing so, because wow. that would be the case, because I would be showing signs of rebellion and doubt if I were to reach out to outside external people for help. So was it like they were just cut off from the family and didn't even see them or you had Thanksgiving meal and it was like we just kind of pretended everything was normal and ignored yeah. it for that those few moments? Yeah, it, it was hard with with yeah within the church it was a honeymoon phase but within the fa our family unit it okay. was very much a mourning phase things totally changed mm. we I didn't see some of my siblings for years after that because we were supposed to cut off connections they were mad at my parents for leaving the church okay. you know and so we there was rejection going at both sides it seemed like though that we wanted to be together that pool was always there the the religious mindset was in the way and so it just like yeah, it never it was never the same and it still isn't the same today, really. So is it considered a divorce for your mom mom to leave your dad and marry the prophet, or is it okay because he had a higher status? Was your dad fine with that? Uh how did that dynamic play out? It was it was not considered divorce because the prophet had a higher status and in, in okay. that church and in our doctrines and mentality, you could only leave your husband technically if you left him for a higher status and through revelation. My dad struggled with it, obviously, because they'd been married for 35 years plus, I wow. think. So they were, you know, teenage sweethearts and everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, he struggled with it, but he did have his second wife and, he kind of went off and lived with her and she had a little uh, son and they became kind of this new family unit. Hmm. And so that might've helped him in the process, but I know it was still okay. hard. I remember seeing them struggle through it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, but I for her, my imagine. mom had always, yeah. But my mom had always kind of sought strong spiritual leadership in her marriage. And she was always kind of the, the, the proactive religious spiritual person of the family. And so for her, though it hurt, of course, she was also, there was also a lot of excitement and wonder for the new, you know, and so. Okay, that, that makes sense. Now, you got, you got married during this, what we called honeymoon season. I think you were maybe 18 years old. Tell us a little yeah. about how that worked out, how you found your wife, what the, just that process. Give us a glimpse of that, if you will. Yeah. Um, well, after my parents separated, I didn't want to live with my dad because I didn't really like his wife, his second mm -hmm. wife as much at the time. I couldn't live with my mom because she went and lived with her sister wives and there was no room for me. So I kind of just began living with a couple of the siblings that were there. Um, I was 16 and I had a job. I started working and I rented, started renting a house when I was 17. Wow. And what what uh, what uh, sparked me to start renting was because this girl her and her best friend, I was actually 16 at the time and they were 14. Her and her best friend came to me and said they received revelation that they were to come into my family and be my, my two wives. Um, wow. th the dynamic there was kind of like, if you didn't get yourself a young man, then an older guy that was, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 would pick you up as a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, sixth wife. And so the young girls there, the church actually allowed them the freedom to choose a husband initially mm. but if they took too long then they would assign them to a man so um so they didn't want to risk it so they both uh, asked to come into my family my wife who is now currently my wife lisa she was the older of the two and so i built the relationship with her first and um we were going to get married in like four days when she turned 16 the state allowed us to get married at 16 by parents permission and so I started renting to prepare for the marriage and we got married when I was 18 and she was four days after her 16th birthday. Okay. Wow. Now your, your camera's shaking a little bit. If there's a little way to, oh, to pull sorry, back, yeah. that, that's okay. I get excited and talk with my hands too. <laughs> um, so you get married, you said you were 18 years old or no, I'm sorry, 16 years old. Cause you can, elab or she was 16. You were 18. Is that right? Did yeah, I mess we, up the math? Yeah. No, okay. no, we had, 
I was 16, she was 14 when she first came to me. We dated for two years until she was old enough to legally marry. Okay, so you, you just married her, though, even though you're in this polygamous cult. Is that right? Right. The, the plan okay. was for me to marry with the other girl as well, but it didn't work Later. out. Later. Okay, all right. Yeah. Got it. So let's fast forward towards this moment when you're 20 years old, you start to have this doubt brought on by this failed prophecy. How many others left the church at this time, or how many others did this doubt uh, start to build in because Jesus didn't return and there weren't the plagues that were described? I think you said March 20-something in 2000, maybe it was? 2000, yeah. Okay. March 25th, 2000. Yeah. Okay. Um, the the There was a few. More people stayed than left. Um, hmm. The ones that did leave were in spiritually, were in leadership, some of the 12 apostles that, the, that the, was in the cult. So it was maybe maybe about three or four of them, I think. Okay. Right off the bat, there was a couple that left immediately, and then maybe mm. a, a half a year passed, and a couple more left. Um, I think it was three. I don't I don't remember. But anyways, they okay. were the kind of the core that left. There was a few other stragglers, but again, more stayed. And someone actually got another revelation saying that the reason Christ didn't come, yes, we needed to do some more things to be more righteous. But also uh, that in order to fulfill the revelation, God would then change time, turn back time so that we would go back to that day and it, he would come on that day, wow. fulfilling the revelation. So it was a whole like wow. sci-fi dynamic going on because God could do anything, right? If God wants to of turn course. back time and fulfill that revelation on that day. So that got people's mentality thinking, oh yeah, of course, God can do anything. Oh my and goodness. now we need to work for the next Ring, uh, next time around when next year on maybe the same day Christ will come and or something we just need to do something more righteous so that we will merit his return and then he'll take us back in time so it just kept getting more strict and more strict and more strict every time we'd have a failed uh, prophecy of his coming but sorry I got I jumped ahead on that I no that's great, that's great. <laughs> but they these you had some of these apostles left I began doubting, but I stayed. So on the surface, I pretended I was totally in, okay. into it. They, they actually called me into to be one of the 12 apostles to replace the one that left wow. uh, at that time. So, and that was at the same time I began doubting. So I was feeling like this hypocrite where on the surface, I was totally in belief, totally on board. But inside there was a turmoil and a, a war happening. So, so during that 10 years of this psychological kind of just struggle you're working through, you're now an apostle. Did you take on an additional wife during that season? There were a couple opportunities too. And we actually really entertained it, thought about it because you really were seen less if you didn't. It was kind of a mark of your righteousness if you had a, a wow. multiple wife, right? Um, and so you were always kind of looking for it. And I had a, a girl come and ask if they could come into our, my wife and I's family. And we said yes, initially. But then just like, there was always something that kind of happened, hmm. just as the other situations. There are several of these, but this is one I'm just okay. you know, giving an example of. That it would get right up to like the last few months and something would happen and be like, no, I don't think this is gonna work out. And we pull the plug on it. And then she'd either go become another man's wife or one of them went and became the prophet's wife. But looking back, I see what a huge blessing it, it was mm -hmm. that I never entered into a polygamous situation, even though I had several opportunities, wow. because if I would have, I would have established a whole other family, a whole other type of life and existence that really would have rooted me to Utah, rooted me to that faith, because where else are you gonna really live polygamy in the States other than Utah? <laughs> and be in that community. So, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, obviously you can see how powerful of a blessing that was that the Lord didn't allow us to, to walk over that line of polygamy. Now, we won't go there, but I can imagine the questions. Had you come out of this movement and then become a Christian, now you have multiple wives and kids of these wives. What do you do as a Christian? Yeah, I won't press you question. on that, but those are really <laughs> tough situations to navigate. Yeah. Okay, so I can imagine somebody going, Jared, this is a false prophecy. Why did you stay for a decade? Get out. How hard is it? Now, obviously, that doesn't understand the dynamics of what you went through. 
but help yeah. people from the outside looking in thinking, why did you stay for 10 years? Why they had such a stronghold over you in that community and your family? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was more of a psychological thing than anything. It was fear that really anchored me, that chained me there. I wouldn't say anchor, chained me there. So that mm. was the dynamic that was ha underlining everything as I tried to process why not leave. Because I asked myself that a hundred times. You know, wow. if it's a false prophecy, then why not? But yet at the same time, because that fear played such a powerful dynamic, dynamic on how I process things, I would always go to the place of, yeah, but, but what if this is true? What if God will turn back time? Or what if I do need to be a little bit more righteous so Christ would come? So mm -hmm. it's that what if mentality that's constantly cycling through my brain and trying to get me to be more obedient to the prophet. In fact, at one point, the doubt became so heavy. This was about two years in. I finally confessed it to my wife because wow. it was just becoming such a heavy burden. But to do so, to like say it out loud was such a huge step because it might meant God might strike me down with lightning. I, like, I rem wow. remember literally thinking that God might kill me if I profess this and speak oh it out God. because that's just the mentality that was fed into me my whole life. Other people might have processed it differently, but I processed it this way. And so this was my experience in it. And so I find she understood, she agreed with me and mm. she saw how heavy it was on my heart. And I went, ended up going and telling the prophet about it. And when I sat down and said, I'm, I'm doubting, I don't want to doubt, you know, I want to be faithful, but this doubt is in me and I'm not sure what to do. He ends up, his response is, well, are you bipolar? Like he didn't even mm. ask a sense of consideration or, mm. or where my heart was at or why I would think that he essentially told me I was bipolar because I was in this struggle. Mm. And he essentially told me if you're, if you're just obedient to everything I say, this doubt will go away. You know, this, this, this weight upon your soul will be lifted through your obedient obedience. So it just made me double down even more and, and try to become more obedient uh, to everything he said. And sure enough, as more years passed, it still did not leave. It was still just constantly there clinging to my soul as I was trying to work through this and be faithful to the prophet and do all the things I was supposed to do. Uh, it, what he told me would happen wasn't happening. So, and it, so, But again, the, because the fear was there, it just kept me there in this, in this battle. So this was not like financial fear. I don't know where I'm going to go get a job. This was purely a spiritual fear for your yeah. soul that kept you there entirely. Exactly. Yeah. So you shared this with your wife two years in. That means there was eight years during this season where you're married before you leave. What was that dynamic like with your wife? Was this an ongoing conversation? Was it just you never mentioned it again? What was that season or relationship like? It was an ongoing conversation. Um, and it was a, a hard ongoing conversation because as my doubt continued to increase, my anger also increased with it because mm. I saw how much was stolen from me, how much I wanted mm. to go to high school. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to learn and do all these things because essentially I was just self-educating myself, reading whatever I could get my hands on. But I wanted the college experience. And for her, because of the dynamic of our relationship and the unhealthiness of it, starting out, you know, first as a plural uh, marriage thing, and and you get this dynamic often in polygamy. It's, it's, I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole, but I think it's pertinent to what I'm trying yeah. to say. You often get in polygamy a man who favors his uh, a certain wife. It's typically mm -hmm. the second, third, fourth wife. Hmm. Um, and she knew that with me and her and this other girl. Initially, I had favored the other girl. But she was the older of the two. And so as it played out, she would be the one I would marry first. Um, looking back, you know, I see how horrific and horrible of a situation it was. And I had no male model to kind of show me the way my, I was no longer living with my dad. No other man in the, in the group came and was a mentor of mine, of mine or anything. So I was kind of just navigating this all on my own. And so there was that built up from it too. We didn't start out health, healthy. She saw I was wanting my life back and that didn't include her. And so she was agreeing with me, but at the same time, she didn't want to go because she knew 
that it would probably end up in divorce and, and break break mm. us apart and our family apart. We had two kids by then. Oh, also, wow. another dynamic that played into it is that she was born into another cult. Um, wow. Her mom had her mom had had an affair. Her mom had had her own family, and then she had an affair with a cult leader up in Salt Lake City. That's where her mom was living. With cult leader there, Arvin Shreve. You might be able to hear hear. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of him, but. She had an affair with this guy and my wife was the product of that affair. And so she was raised in that cult. It was hev- it heavily sexually molested their children. Holy and God. the word got out to FBI authorities. They sent in an informant, uh, gathered the evidence and the FBI raided this group. And my wife was put into the foster care system because her mom was put into jail. Okay. And so her, her whole life had been just turmoil and, and uprooted in all this stuff. And for the first time now moving forward, you know, 10 years, we being married in this new cult that her parent, her mom had joined was the same cult my parents had joined. And that's where we met. Okay. And so we had finally established a life that was at least stable and we had a family mm-hmm. and that's what all she had ever wanted was stability and family mm-hmm. because her upbringing had been so horrendous. And so she, though she agreed with me and she knew it was wrong, this was life and this where this is what was consistency and this is where we had our family and she didn't want to lose that if i left and so we went through this battle this these 10 years of me of this conversation happening me trying to convince her to go but her not coming because of those reasons and we would always end up fighting and and just feeling totally defeated and it was just a dark dark season so you that's another dynamic i don't often talk about is that as dark as it was in our doubt and our fear, it was also incredibly dark for our marriage because this mm. was the dynamic that was going on back and forth, feeling the pain, feeling the suffering. We were feeling ripped apart, but yet we had so much fear and doubt. We didn't know where to go or what to do with it. So we we're just trying to survive where we were at and it just put us in a really bad place. So I want to come back to when the two of you get on the same page and leave but and this may be outside of your your purview, but do you have any sense of how many cults like the one you grew up in were or are still in Utah or the surrounding areas today? Uh, last time I heard, I I think there's hundreds. I mean, because they've been they've been de- wow. de- been developing since the days of really Wilfred Woodruff and the Manifesto in 1890 when the Mormon Church decided to no longer live polygamy. You've had upright, uh, different breakoffs ever since then for the last, you know, hundreds, hundred years. And so they're all over the place in Utah. Um, some are more distinct than others. Some are way bigger than others, like the FLDS, Warren Jeffs and that group. Mm-hmm. But you do have, I think, hundreds of these smaller cult groups. Ours, at the, at the, in that time, in the 90s and early 2000s, we were one of the more popular and probably a little bigger of them. Um, but... Yeah. So it's not a, it's not a, it's a common thing in Utah. It's not like it's never hardly ever happens. So So, last question before we shift back to you leaving is it sounds like this cult was not, you weren't going out and evangelizing and trying to reach those in the LDS church and non-Christians. It was escapist, get away from the world and prepare. God is going to come in and save us and usher in this judgment. We did initially. We did try to evangelize initially. We did okay. try to warn warn Mormons. We we they sent missionaries to England at one point. Wow. Um, yeah, there's um, hmm. we had we did some of that. Yeah, and we wrote our own pamphlets. We handed them out to people. It's all warning, hmm. last days, doom and gloom type scenarios. Uh, mostly condemning the Mormon Church and saying that we were the true church on earth. Come and join us. And then it came to a point where we'd done that. To, exa- to exhaustion that we said, okay, we're cutting it off. Jesus is going to come. Now it's time just to prepare. And so there was okay. a shift. And from that point moving forward, who God had already gathered were the ones he had chosen to bring about his work in the last days. Okay. So during this 10 years of just psychological distress, anxiety, uh, your marriage was dark the way you described it. Was there a season where you thought, you know what, I'm just going to completely chuck religion and become an agnostic or an atheist did you entertain that for any season at all? I did. Ab- absolutely. <laughs> we would sometimes go to Provo, uh, which is about an hour from where we were. And I was 
perusing the books in Barnes and Noble one day and I saw in the book in The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. Mm. I, I opened it up, started reading it, and I had never even conceived the idea that maybe God didn't exist. Maybe this was wow. all just just a, a, a show, right? I don't know why you would think I would have thought that at that point, but I didn't because he was just so inherently a part of who I was. Mm. And I read Dawkins and I was just like, for the first time, and I'd, for the first time I'd felt hope. It was a false hope, obviously. It was wow. a fleeting hope. Wow. But I felt this hope like, oh my gosh, if God isn't real, then all this fear I have is irrational. And so I began to try to rationalize God away. And I was re I read Dawkins, but Dawkins didn't appeal to me after a while because he his characteristics was a lot like the prophets. But on the other side of the spectrum mm. of Jim Harveston, he was just very black and white. <laughs> the way he delivered his stuff, it was this and this. And so it reminded me of the guy I was having to struggle with. But mm -hmm. then I also honed in on Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, these new atheist voices that you can get a lot of on YouTube and writings and stuff. And so that I really, for a couple of years, began soaking in all their stuff and wanted so badly. I, I tried so hard to be an atheist because it would explain all my fear away. Um, mm. And I had I remember having two major hurdles in that time. The first was the uh, the way that they dealt with love, the idea of love. Hmm. I mean, not believing in God in and of itself was was a step of faith just because it's all built on theory right so you had to believe in that 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 theory was correct in order to believe that god didn't exist as much as you had to believe that god did exist it took just as much faith to not believe in god as it did to believe in mm. god and so with evolution and, and the process of evolution being touted so heavily i even though i i read the theor theoretical uh, arguments on the existence of love i struggled with it because the dynamic of love and what it was was so diametrically opposite to what evolution presented as survival of the fittest. And I couldn't mm. get that, those two characteristics to like kind of just work and be okay with that because they were just so opposite. It didn't seem to, to go along with. So I struggled with that, with the idea and concept of love. And then I couldn't shake this, this, this seed deep inside of me that I was loved. So I had that love wow. piece that was just kind of threaded throughout the whole thing. And that I was loved by a creator. And I tried to explain it away. I tried to rationalize away, but it, I couldn't shake it. I couldn't get myself to believe that I was actually loved by God, mm. which my response to that made me that much more furious at God, because why would he allow me to go through so much pain and agony and frustration and doubt and fear when all I wanted was him, and yet I felt totally abandoned by him. And so mm. that was something that I just began wrestling with because, okay, I can't rationalize God away. And I feel loved by him. I don't know why, because I'm going through all this. Why isn't he helping me through this? <laughs> and my anger rose. But in that, in that process, I also found this guy named C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. I'd become a big Tolkien fan. I love Lord of the Rings. I found out that they were friends, which fascinated me. So I started reading about their lives and the Inklings and all that. And then I found all I'd known Lewis for was Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe in the Narnia series. Oh, but okay. then... I saw that he had actually written some apologetic stuff about Christ. And I started reading, I think first I found screw tape letters. Okay. And then obviously I found mere Christianity, but what work he did that really just struck me was uh, a grief observed that he wrote at, wow. uh, as a response to his wife, joy dying. Yeah. And he starts out somewhere in there in the beginning where he says, no one ever told me that grief felt so much like fear. And when he said that, I just like connected with him because wow. I was so full of fear. He was so full of grief. And then his expression throughout that whole narrative was like he was just plucking my thoughts from out of my mind and putting them on the page of the struggle that I've been going through. And, and he, wow. he talks about love in that and your ultimate does. love being found in Christ and God. And that was connecting back to, to me feeling loved inside. And so I just, there's just dynamic happening where I was trying to push God away, but God was mm. really having none of it. So, so I, I want to come back to this C.S. Lewis dynamic and other books that shaped you. But when you said the two things that kept you from atheism, one, this idea of love, 
And that makes sense to me. I mean, for love, there has to be free will that you choose to care for somebody. I don't think atheism or evolution can give an account of free will. There has to be an objective moral code for there to be acts that are really loving versus those that are not. That theoretical argument, I think, can be powerful. But where did this sense that you are loved by God come from? Certainly, it wasn't preached in this cult, given all the fear and doom and spiritual abuse. Did that come from your earlier days within the broader Mormon church? Or is this something you think God just placed on your heart? I think both. I think a little both. Because obviously, my idea of Jesus and, and Christ, though Mormons believe him to be different, uh, you know, a different person than what Christians do, eternally anyways, um, that those seeds were planted when I was a kid. I remember my mom telling me the first thing, first time I remember hearing about Jesus, I looked at a picture and she told me, I asked, who is, who's this? And she said, that's Jesus Christ. He's the only perfect Mm. man that ever lived and Mm. he loves you. You know, something like that. And that has always stuck with me through the years, that person of Jesus that loved me, that was perfect. Um, Mm. And so I did have that, but even more so than that, I think it was just that spiritual assurance that I didn't know what it was or how to explain it, but I just could not push away or rationalize away this deep seated love in Mm. me. And I didn't know what to do with it. Okay. So it's interesting that you read a grief observed because I actually teach a class Um, at, in our graduate apologetics program on why does God allow evil? And we talk about the intellectual challenge. And of course, I don't assign it, but we could assign the problem of pain by CS Lewis, which he wrote when he was younger grief observed he wrote when he's older and it's really just a lament of his experience more so than an apologetic so that book that connected your grief with fear unlocked certain ideas for you what other books or ideas started to unlock so to remind our audience you had doubts okay let me take a step back you had doubts around 2000 with a failed prophecy when was it that you read this got a grief observed by c.s lewis and things start to shift positively yeah i can't remember exactly when it was but where the shift happened was in about 2010. um i was going through this this i just kind of come out of this atheist phase knowing that god loved me but i didn't know what to do with that and i I remember reading Mm. c.s lewis before this a certain experience i'm about to tell but I don't remember which C.S. Lewis works I was reading at that point. It wasn't a lot. It was like maybe one or two. But my wife and I got in one of these other these conversations again where I was trying to convince her to leave with me. But mm-hmm. she was saying no because she knew it would mean that it would break up our family. My reasoning for doing that and constantly kind of getting in these relationships or these, these uh, conversations was I felt like if I had someone supporting me, it would help me hurdle this fear. And so it was really more so self-centric by all means self-centric and me just getting what I was want st- had been striving for for so long rather than keeping the family unit together. So it was really a selfish endeavor though it might have seemed on externally not to be. But I was trying to convince her and she said why in that conversation she ended up saying something like why should I follow you when I see you have absolutely no relationship with God. And when wow yeah when she said that I just, it just struck me and I knew what she said was true. Um, I had been reading scripture a lot, but my approach to scripture was always to try to convince myself that the cult was wrong and to prove the cult wrong. So I wasn't reading scripture to know God better or to know the mysteries of God wow. or who he is or his love. I was trying to read it so that I could further convince myself that they were wrong, I was right, and that would justify me leaving. So though, the, though that might seem like a noble pursuit of scripture, it was not a godly mm. pursuit of scripture because it was mm. very self, I approached it in a self-centric way rather than a Christ-centric way. And so she said that knowing it was evident I didn't have a relationship with God. And it just brought me to my knees that night. Wow. And I abandoned all types of prayer that the church, the cult had taught us to pray in the temple. There's these secret ways to pray. They call it the true order prayer. And for the first time in the last like, since I'd gotten my endowment at 14, so 15 years or whatever, I don't know, 20 years. For the first time I prayed 
just normally. <laughs> I usually would kneel at an altar. I'd have these robes on. I'd offer up all these secret signs and penalties they teach you. But now I just abandoned all that, got on my knees and said, God, I am done here. I can't take another step. I can't walk, wow. keep doing this and trying to be somebody that I'm not. I don't know what to do. I'm done. If you want me somewhere, carry me there. I'm yours. So I just uttered that. I just kind of came into this complete surrender of, mm. I believe you exist. I believe you're Christ or you're God. And the one truth that had really bridged my whole experience from this point to where I had, was at this point at this time was that doctrine of Christ's perfection, wow. right? That was the one thing I was, could rely upon because there were so many things that the cult had was teaching me that I wasn't seeing in scripture. Like I was reading scripture, like I'd mentioned and seeing it differently than how the cult was teaching me. Uh, I was seeing it the way C.S. Lewis was talking about it. Like I said, he, it was like he plucked my thoughts out of my mind and put them on the page. That's how I was reading scripture, but I, oh, sorry for the camera shake. Oh, that's, all right. <laughs> that's how I was re reading scripture, but I could never get it to fit with how I'd always been taught it. And I, so I threw scripture out because I was just done with it. It just frustrated me. And so I, I just came to the surrender. I, 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 I don't know what to do. I'm yours but I trusted in that perfection of Christ. And when I, when I made that confession, this understanding just swept over me that everything wow. I'd built my, everything I built my understanding of on who God was had been built on the foundation of family and the prophet of this cult and my traditions. And that was like building on the sinking sand that was constantly being swept out from under me. And I needed to no longer build on that, that all needed to go away and build on the rock of Christ alone. And when I did that, when I, that realization came over to me or came over me, I just knew at that point, it's all about Christ. It's not about me. Wow. It's everything that he does, not what I can do. And everything changed for us after that point. So the understanding of who Christ is in the mainstream Mormon church is very different than who Christ is in the historic Orthodox Church. So right. why not cling to this understanding since this is your family, this is everything you knew? Why cling to what I would argue is a more biblical understanding of who Jesus is? Right. Well, that I, I'm jumping at, I would jump ahead a little bit with that, but I came into this confession and this surrender more so by the attributes that I understood rather than the person that I understood. Okay. So I was clinging more to that love and more to that, that perfection and more to that grace than thinking that this was actually God who had come and dwelled fully in Christ. You know, as Colossians, Paul tells us in Colossians, mm. I wasn't, I didn't have that understanding okay. at that point. It was all based on these attributes of knowing I was loved and believing he was perfect. And, and I didn't, I couldn't rationalize it yet or articulate it at that point, but that I was not going to get to him through my efforts. It was Got done it. by what he had already done. And I believed in the salvation work of Jesus as a Mormon. I might not have understood who he was as a Mormon, but I believed in those salvation works. And so as limited as it was, those truths were still there to, that kind of just was a thread that I clung to as I worked my way Okay. through this deeper theology. But at that point, I had no idea where I was going with it. I was just totally, God, I'm yours. I know you love me. Take me. And then that's what happened. Things changed. So. Okay, so I need to know what changed then in your relationship with your wife. Was there a point where you went to her and said, we can't keep living a lie. I will stay with you. Let's go together. Was there that kind of moment? How did the two of you get out together? Yeah, so... Obviously, I was sharing with her what I was reading C.S. Lewis's works with her. Mm. And that she, we were beginning to like have a bolstered understanding of God and grace. We had no really idea about the concept of grace. Um, they, te they talk about grace in Mormonism, but you don't understand really what mm -hmm. that is, right? And what that means. Because it's, after all you can do, then by grace are you saved, like Nephi talks about in Second Nephi. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't realize that that grace is there with you the whole time from the day you're born, <laughs> that there's a redemptive plan, you know, ready to bring you back when you believe in Jesus and follow him. So um, reading Lewis brought that out. 
for us. And it would begin to rekindle both for both of us, a relationship with God. And in that also a relationship with one another. Um, she also found a book uh, on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, mm. Metaxas, Eric Metaxas's book back in, that he wrote back in the early 2000s, the popular one. And <clears throat> we read that together. She, uh, she showed it to me, we read it together. And we saw how this man, well, one thing that really struck us was that uh, Metaxas puts snippets of Hitler's speeches in there. Mm. And the things that Hitler was saying was literally verbatim to what our prophet was saying in some of his Sunday wow. sermons about us being a chosen race and God ordaining wow. us to do specific things. And we're like, wait, what? Hitler said these same type of things. <laughs> so that really struck us and woke us up. Mm. But also what pre the predominant message of Bonhoeffer was just seeing his life. If this man could stand up against Nazi Germany for truth and for wow. Christ, then we could do the same with this little cult in Mentai, Utah. Mm. Um, and then I found, I don't remember how, it was just like by accident, I found Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians on my Kindle, huh. a free book on Amazon. I was just looking for anything to learn more about Christ. And that was there because, you know, copyright's gone. It's over a hundred years. <laughs> started reading that. And I was just like so blown away. The he was answering specifically all the doctrinal questions I had about the righteousness of Christ. Christ, And that there's, you know, by works, we are never saved. It's only, we were found righteous through him. And Luther gets into the nitty gritty of all that and, and unfolds it for you. And my wife and I were sitting on the edge of our bed, just reading that. And it was really wow. in reading Luther and understand him answering all those specific questions we had about salvation and righteousness found in Christ that said, okay, we can't stay here any longer. Luther kicked us off the cliff. We were like, we were ready mm -hmm. to jump, but we were still too, still too scared to jump. And when we read Luther, we knew God was calling us out of this cult and that we had to go. And so he really used a couple years. That, this was in 2012. So okay. from 2010, when I surrendered my life over to Christ and my wife and I both began going through this process, went clear to 2012 until when we finally left. And I was 32, she was 30. Wow, 32. Uh, so I just love the image of a commentary on Galatians from 100 years ago, having somebody on the edge of their seat in anticipation. Yeah. That's that's how <laughs> theology comes alive. I'm going to remember that one. Uh, okay, so you guys decide, how old are your kids in 2012, roughly? Uh, uh, 12, 10, 8, something like oh, that. Oh, wow. So you're... Yeah oldest was somewhat close to the age you were when you left and went to the Mormon. That's a really interesting dynamic. Yeah. What was yeah. that like with your kids and with your wife and even announcing to the church or the prophets? Or was it like, grab your stuff and go get out of Dodge? What was that like? Yeah, it was kind of both. I mean, we did grab our stuff and go and get out of Dodge. But this was our life. I mean, these, this, these were the people mm. we'd known for the last 20, 20 years. Our whole mm. life had been embedded there. And so it was hard. We, I wrote a letter, but we knew that as soon as we uh, told people we would be emerged, people would just come and you know want to know what's going on. We didn't want that. We didn't want to deal with it. Mm. I still had siblings in the cult. And I didn't even tell them. And so most of the people that had left, had left in anger. Most people that left this cult had mm -hmm. abandoned, usually they've abandoned God or some had even committed suicide and the prophet would hold oh, that over yeah. your head. Like if you Jeez. leave, you know, then you're, you're left to the powers of Satan and he will come in and make your life a living hell. And so that fear was always there, but we didn't want to have to just like battle any of that. We didn't want to leave in anger either. We'd actually found within that year as before we left, we knew we had to go through a sense of healing at the same time. There was awareness mm -hmm. that we couldn't leave in anger because um, of all that had happened with people that had left in anger. And the Lord actually brought us the story of Nate Saint and um, El Elliot and mm -hmm. um, what happened to them on in their journey. I think it was down in Ecuador or somewhere down there mm -hmm. and how their wives, they were killed by tribesmen and bringing the yeah. word of God to that, those people. And then their wives, forgave the tribe who killed their husband, bringing the, allowing wow. a, which created a bridge for them to bring the gospel into that place, right? That's right. Where they've been rejected. And so to see how these women were able to forgive a certain people for the killing their own husbands, 
we definitely were equipped to be able to, God had equipped us to forgive this people before we left so that we can leave, leave at least in some semblance of healthiness and love. So I did write up a letter though, and I thanked everyone and said, thank you for whatever uh, you've done for us. I went through specifics, but I felt like I still needed to make a stand on something. <laughs> and sure. so I did give, give some reasoning. But then we, as soon as I emailed that out, five minutes later, we were gone. Um, wow. And we began trying to, we were in our lower thirties, right? And for the first time in our life, we had choice. We didn't know what to do, where to go. Um, and so we spent that month kind of figuring that out. If I go into all the details, it will be a yeah. three hour story. So I'm not going <laughs> to. Yeah, that's, that's fair. We'll have part two, or you can save that for your book. Um, yeah. that I understand you're working there, on and there, want to encourage you as much as I can to write. Uh, yeah. so we'll come back to some of that season. Uh, tell us your theology student now, what you want to do. Do you want to go be a missionary back in Salt Lake City? Do you want to get as far or anywhere in Utah or get as far away as you can from this? What's your hopes and kind of dream and passion moving forward now? Uh, I'm actually a, a pastor now. I graduated in May from Gordon Conwell. Oh, so you're I'm done. A pastor now. Great. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm start. I'm an associate pastor, and I've been associate pastor for about eight, nine months now, ten months or so. Um, so that's just going on this journey where God is leading us. I was initially thinking I'd go the academic route. Um, but my last semester, some things happened and, uh, God shift our desires and brought us to this church, a church up in Maine. So where I'm currently an associate pastor. Oh, congratulations. So from, Good. Yeah. So from there on, I'm, I've always felt a call to write and a, some sense of ministry. I actually began feeling the call to ministry when we were back in the cult a couple months before we left. Um, but mm. I pushed it away. For one, I didn't really understand it, what that meant. Sure. And two, I, I began pushing it away because I just, I was coming out of this religious commitment for the last 20 years. And the last thing I wanted to do was commit myself to some other type of religious endeavor. endeavor. And so I was really in the mentality when we left the cult that I would never be involved in organized religion again. I believe in Jesus and I'd be you know, a Jesus follower but I didn't want to ever be a part of a church. Um, but God quickly changed those plans soon after that. But I don't know if you want me to go into that or not. But. <laughs> um, oh, gosh. I have so many questions for you, Jared. Let me ask you this. What advice, looking back on your experience, what advice would you have for somebody to either reach out to somebody? I know these are differences, differences here. In the Mormon church, the mainstream Mormon church, and or somebody who's in more of a polygamous cult. Do you have any ways to reach either or both of those? Are they similar? Are they different? What advice would you have for Christians who want to care for their Mormon neighbors and friends? And or if they come across somebody online or in person, if there's hundreds of these in Utah and maybe beyond, uh, what advice for engaging somebody there? Um. Yeah, I mean, if you, they are different as far as mainstream Mormon and the fundamentalist cults that break off of. The fundamentals of them are the same and where they're coming from, what their mm. understanding of Jesus and the Godhead, but their approach to those fundamentals are very different. And as you would in Christianity, the fundamental side will be far more black and white, far more strict. So you have to approach it from a certain angle, angle contextualize things in a certain way for them if you were to go talk to them. For okay. mainstream Mormonism, which is the majority of our circumstances and situations we'd be dealing with, there's more kind of openness there. And so I think back what would have helped me um, and in the conversations I've had with Mormons since I've left. When I was a kid, they in Manti, there was this big pageant that they would have every year. And it would draw in thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of Mormons to this one spot. And it would also draw in a lot of street evangelists and, and missionaries coming from other places. And they, they, they would friends. come and there. Yeah, exactly. And I would go down there and try to debate the street evangelist just for the fun of it. You know, that was like my thing. <laughs> because I was you know, so stunned. Yeah. And I heard the gospel many times in that, in mm. that, um, those experiences. But one line that they would always uh, say to me that always put up my defense mechanisms 
was what they were saying was good. You know, they would be going and going all great. But then they would say this, the Jesus you believe in isn't the real Jesus, isn't the biblical Jesus. Hmm. And when they would say that, I would be like, what are you talking about? The Jesus I believe in isn't the real Jesus. I've had true spiritual experience with this Jesus. I believe he's leading my life. I believe he loves me. And so I would be in that mentality, I would put up my defense mechanisms and everything else they would say thereafter, I would not be listening to. I would just be seeking to like whatever or reason it away. Um, so in that sense, I don't think debate is always the healthiest approach for hmm. missionary work to Mormons. Hmm. I would suggest probably a, a different approach, more of approach where you're starting on a foundation where there's a sense of agreement. For me, if I think back, it would be the perfection of Jesus. That's something that we can both relate to. We may have a different understanding of who Jesus is eternally, but, oh, and on earth, because who he is on earth makes up who, who he was in eternity makes up who he is on earth, right? But the doctrine and the attribute of his perfection is the same. They believe he was the only perfect person to ever walk the earth. They believe Joseph Smith was with sin. They mm -hmm. don't believe he was perfect like Jesus. We believe Jesus was the only perfect person. So start on that level playing field, come to get to know them, be in relationship with them. I don't even really think you should begin discussion with them until you're a person they can trust, right? And so start with that and then begin to show them the sufficiency of Jesus, build on that understanding of his perfection. Because as you show them the perfect Jesus, the sufficient Jesus, that Jesus will begin to challenge everything about mm. their belief system. Because as they hold up what they believe in with Joseph Smith and the church, all founded on Joseph being, you know, being a prophet, but yet still burdened with sin. As you challenge that, like, why would you do anything different than who Jesus is, the, the most perfect being mm -hmm. that you believe is perfect, I believe is perfect. God, scripture tells us God gave us everything we need through Jesus. So why do we need to add all this stuff to who Jesus is? That's really the process I went through that took me a few years to, 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 mm -hmm. to reason come into a sense of, of, of being in a healthy walk with Christ. Because when I made that confession and said, Christ, I'm yours, things started happening. I had to look at the Book of Mormon. I had to look at Joseph Smith, all these things that meant everything to me, that my, my life and my identity had been founded in. And I had to confront them with the person of Christ and this perfect Jesus that I believed was perfect, both in Mormonism mm -hmm. and now as I was coming into Christianity. And when I held those up and we confronted them with the perfect Jesus, hmm. they all fell to the wayside. Wow. Why would I need them when I had Jesus? And so I think kind of beginning to build a conversation on that mentality, you have to know their doctrines. You have to know the nuances sure. of why they believe what they believe. But when you're using that as your anchor and really challenging everything about who they are by Jesus, which is a dynamic we as Christians also need, Jesus changes everything about who we are in this world. And so we need to bring and lift up the reality of who Jesus is for ourselves on a daily basis, because we have our own idols of the heart, right? We, we, the self is hmm. constantly works its way to our center. We constantly try to make our way, our self, the center of our universe and why we do what we do rather than remembering that we are founded in Christ and Christ is our salvation. We were born again in Christ and that defines and changes everything about who we are in this world. So if you use that same type of approach and dynamic dynamic with a Mormon, I think it would be helpful because they yeah. do believe in that perfection of who he is. Last question. As much as you're comfortable, tell us where your family is at. Have some completely left the cult all? Have some come back to the mainstream Mormon church? Some become Christians. Some go down that road of atheism. Where are some of your brothers, sisters, and larger family at right now, spiritually? Um, some are Mormon still. Uh, I have three or four siblings that are still Mormon. I have a few that are agnostic. Uh, or mm. one, one that I know is agnostic, maybe a little new age so I'm not sure. <laughs> She'd probably mm. laugh at me if I said that. But um, a couple I don't really know. They're not Mormon. Mm. I think they, they believe in God, but there's no like sense of faith there. And then um, a couple that are still part of the cult. My dad actually left wow. the cult and went, mm -hmm. went back to the Mormon church. Um, my mom actually died in the Mormon church a year before I left. Mm -hmm. And then we are the only Christians, uh, wow. my wife and I. 
God brought us out of there. And in his great mercy and love and grace, he brought us through together, my wife and I. There's no reason that we should still be together based on our past wow. and everything that happened to us. And yet he maintained and has restored and renewed so much of our relationship with us and our three kids. And then we adopted after we left. Um, one of the experiences in the cult was that my wa- my wife would get very sick during his pr- her pregnancies, like mm. she would throw up throughout the whole mm. the whole term. And then um, the cult the prophet actually commanded her to get her tubes tied. The prophet did mm. because she wasn't able to attend all our meetings, and so that was contributing to our unworthiness because she needed to be at all her meetings, and she wasn't getting to the meetings because she was wow. sick during the pregnancies. And so at one point. Harmston, the, the prophet, uh, said, it's time to get your tubes tied. And so we didn't want to, but we feared if we didn't, then something yep. would happen to the child. And so that's our mentality. So we did. And that was a very damaging, broken, hurtful thing for us. But God renewed that after we left and we were able to adopt um, soon after, which was a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful experience for us. So we have four kids total now. So our family okay. unit stayed intact by God's grace. Great. Uh, when, but everyone else, as far as my external family, they're all kind of in different spectrums. And we're first generation Christians, my wife and I. Wow. That is incredible. The amount of power this cult leader, Harmston, I think you said, had to have a woman get her, her tubes tied. It makes sense emotionally and psychologically where you're at yeah. to make that decision. But that level yeah. of control is just stunning and disturbing and yeah, pretty absolutely. high level of spiritual abuse. At, Lord bless you in your family, in your ministry. Um, really thankful for your story. I first heard about you. I was just following the Gospel Coalition, saw the story. I was like, wow, that is so interesting and yeah. really yeah. want to have you on. I knew my viewers would want to hear your story as well. I know you work on another article for the Gospel Coalition, but do you are you on social media? Can people follow you? Or are you more just kind of wanting to be a pastor and get away from a lot of this stuff and minister to people <laughs> locally? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I'm trying to build a social media just because I was told someone in the publishing agency if I if I'm gonna start writing and, and which I which is what I'm working for is really to be a, a writer, then I need some type of platform. So uh, I am doing that though ruefully. And, okay. <laughs> but the, the best way to contact me, I guess, would be through that. I'm on Instagram or Facebook. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, but, or email me, but I don't know if you have an email. Uh, my, you can go to our church website and my email would be on there because I'm a pastor at our church. But. You might get flooded with emails. So people who caught this <laughs> don't send <laughs> endless questions to him. Only send one or two pointed questions if you really need his help. Yeah. <laughs> so you put it out there, but just respect the time that it takes as well if you feel the need to reach out. But I would imagine, Jared, if somebody's watching this, and they're maybe in a polygamous cult or trying to reach out to somebody and somehow came across this, you would love to get a contact from them and would come alongside them and help them through the process as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, when your book is out, regardless of how big your social media platform is, let me know and I will spread the okay. word on my platform. Maybe we can have a follow-up conversation. I'll connect you with some other folks who have platforms because this story absolutely unmistakably needs to get out just a story of god's grace and his favor in your life and uh i'm super encouraged can't wait to show this to my own family and my kids and talk about it with them as well so thanks for being faithful thanks for sharing the story i don't you know i didn't ask you this you don't have to answer it how hard or easy it is to share that story um but your willingness to come and do it i can tell you from the outside there will be people interested in your book and uh, it's a powerful story that needs to be told. So be encouraged uh, to do so as well. Thank you. Those of you watching, there, make sure. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, there's just so much more God did in mm. delivering us from the cult. The things that mm. happened afterwards, the miracles and the, just the miraculous work that's brought us here today since we left in 2012 has just been incredible. Just getting us out because we didn't have work for even the whole year. We were totally reliant on the cult when we left. And yet God opened doors and provided a way. So, But that's another story that I won't get into. (laughs) We will have part two when your book is out to motivate the word. We'll start in 2012 because that's a whole nother season of your life. 
and yeah. we'll cover that. So let me know when it's coming out. I know it's down the road. We'll have that conversation if it helps. Okay. Uh, I can't wait wait to hear about it. Those who watch and make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other conversations. Mormonism is a topic we sometimes revisit on this channel, as well as other world religions. You mentioned atheism. We talk about that. Make sure you hit subscribe. Got a lot of conversations coming up. If you thought about studying apologetics, we have a fully distance program top rated in the world in apologetics it's online and we talk about world religions sometimes we offer weekend courses on mormonism we would love to come by and equip you if you're not quite ready for masters we have a certificate program and actually bio has given me a pretty significant discount code below where we will kind of walk you through certain lectures and help train you a little bit more formally formally but not the level of of a master's Jared, thanks so much for being generous with your time. I'm already looking forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much, Sean. Appreciate you having me.